My name is Dr. G. Welcome to That's Unusual, my podcast uncovering the unusual stories behind the world's most interesting people. On this show, we celebrate what makes us different and how we convert those differences into unexpected opportunities. Welcome to That's Unusual. I've got one quick favor to ask. If you're enjoying these episodes, I'd love for you to subscribe to this podcast series on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And while you're there, leave me a review. That helps me better understand if you're enjoying these shows and certainly keeps me motivated to keep producing more for you. My inspiring guest today is my good friend and adventure junkie, Yannick Silver, complete with stories of crazy adventures to fill a lifetime of worth and purpose. Yannick redefines how business is played in the 21st century at the intersection of more profits, more fun, and more impact. He is the author of Evolved Enterprise and founder of Maverick 1000, a global collective of the top entrepreneurs and industry innovators. Yannick serves on the Constellation Board for Virgin Unite, the entrepreneurial foundation of the Virgin Group and Branson Family. So who is part of his inner circle? Well, only the who's who of the industry icons that include Sir Richard Branson, Tony Hawk, Chris Blackwell, John Paul DeJoria, Tony Shea, Russell Simmons, Tim Ferriss, and many, many more. His lifetime goal is to connect visionary leaders and game changers to co-create ideas and new business models to measurably impact or solve 100 global issues. As you listen to this podcast, I ask that you reflect on your own unusual stories and unique qualities that can help open doors to unexpected opportunities. And so with that, let's get started. I have with me today the one and only Yannick Silver, founder of Maverick 1000, among a number of other things. Welcome to the show, Yannick. Hey, Gotham, what's up? Great to have you on. I'm just fascinated by your story and what you're up to. You were one of the featured speakers that we had as a storyteller at Unusual Intersections this year and just simply inspired and wowed the guests and the audience that was there. So excited for our listeners on this podcast to get a little bit of a backdrop in terms of who you are and what you're up to. Why don't we just jump right in and you know talk a little bit about Maverick 1000 and how that got started, how you got into that space and, and what it actually does. Yeah, absolutely. So About eight, nine years ago, I was probably best known for being in the digital marketing online space. And, you know, by all sort of accounts and measures, people would be looking at what I was doing and making a lot of money, had a great reputation in that space. And I asked myself this really sort of tough question, but really simple question, which was, you know, would I be happy doing the same thing, you know, 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. And am I happy? And if I was real honest with myself, the answer was no. And so that forced this sort of journey of what Maverick 1000 turned into. And originally, it was called Maverick Business Adventures. It was this idea of, hey, let me hang out with other cool, fun entrepreneurs. Let's go do great adventures together. And we'll do some business sessions. And we'll have maybe some sort of charity element to it. So those three main things. And the first trip was a Baja dune buggy trip. And that lost about $40,000. And then about $400,000 in, my wife's like, well, well, what the hell are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, I have no idea, but there's something here. And so then that set up the two paths that I could have gone on, which is one, go back to what I was originally doing with the, the publishing side and the internet marketing mm-hmm. side and kind of the golden handcuffs because I, I knew that path and that was already lucrative. But there's something really pulling me in this direction of there's something bigger to work with impactful entrepreneurs that can make a difference in the world and have some fun in the process. And during that, I guess, soul searching time, that sideways time, one of the questions I asked myself, and I, I love this, it came from a guy named Brian Johnson, who I think cribbed it from someone else. But his question was, what would your 110-year-old self tell you? Mm. So mine was, what would your 111-year-old self tell you? I kind of <laughs> like alliteration with numbers and words. And and so my answer was, light a thousand suns. And so that turned into Maverick 1000 because of this idea, of, you know, could you bring a thousand game-changing entrepreneurs together that can make a difference in the world? And then that that really started this evolution of what the group turned into which was you know, bringing together exceptional industry leaders and people with big voices and distribution that, that could get together and help each other in business, but also use their skills and brain power to, to really make a dent in the universe in some way and have some fun. So I love that. So tell us a little bit about how you make that happen. I mean, is this a membership community? How do you identify these 
these folks that are part of Maverick 1000? Yeah, it is. It, you know, it's evolved into a membership group, kind of a collective. I mean, they they really call it a family, and that's you know mm, that's exciting yeah. because that's we've really built that community up to truly feel like there's a deep, deep sense of belonging. And we'll talk about a few of those ways that we do it. We get together a couple times a year because the group is international in scope. And so we come together a couple times a year, different places. Usually there might be a field trip to a unique business. There could be a, a unique business icon that is part of it. Sometimes it's just the members because they're all exceptional in their own right and sharing what they're doing. And then we spend one day on business, one day of working with a nonprofit or cause partner, and then one day of some sort of adventure experience. And it's so like the last one was just in Miami and and the impact day was helping a nonprofit that we've worked a lot with called Caring House Foundation, which builds self-sustaining villages in, in Haiti. And we always pose a challenge to the members and then they're a competitive lot. So we use that for us as we break them off into teams and then let them present on the best idea. And then there's a prize for that. The challenge was, okay, to take these self-sustaining villages and how do we create an even better microeconomic engine that does really self-sustain these villages? And the winning team had a great connection to this one company that takes plastic and recycles it and then ships it back out to the U.S. and sells it for, I guess, a hard material for whatever to recycle it, but a better way of recycling it. So it was really exciting because that can turn into a business opportunity for, for each village as a co-op. And they were the winner. And so we use you know that brain power. And then they use their resources to help move that along further. Yeah, I love that example. And I love this marriage between putting together change makers and people who are truly making a difference out in this world and marrying it with you know, creating some sort of social impact. And certainly you talk about that a lot in your book, The Evolved Enterprise, which is getting rave reviews. And I definitely want to dive into that a little bit, but we're not done with the Maverick piece yeah. of it yet. Tell me, how long ago did you start this and what are some types of experiences that you've put together for them? So we started in 2008 and the first one was a Baja Dune Buggy Racing. And a lot there's a lot of adventures at the beginning part of it. And then, as I said, it's kind of moved into more of a uh, more of these collectives that get together. And then so the adventures have come down in, I guess, size and, and what they are. And then we'll do a couple every year that are big ones. So the group just went to South Africa and did whitewater rafting on the Zambezi River and, and a safari at, at Richard Branson's Lodge. And they did cage diving with Great White. So that was, that was a pretty good high adrenaline one. And then we'll do things like a couple of years ago when the Mayan calendar changed over, we actually spent the night in a Mayan village we were the first group that ever spent the night in this village. And literally at midnight of the solstice, we were doing a Temescal, which is like a Native American kind of sweat lodge in a way. And we literally came out at midnight and, you know, couldn't have been planned. It was just incredibly synchronistic. And so we'll do things like that as well. We'll go to Haiti, like I mentioned, and then a complete juxtaposition. We'll spend the week on Richard Branson's Island every year as well. How do you come up with these ideas? A lot of them are things that I want to do or on my list of things that I want to do. So sometimes they're, they're totally personal. Like a couple of years back, we flew MiG jets in, in Russia. And then it also back ended to an opportunity for me to speak in Moscow, which was really cool because I was born in Moscow. And then I brought my dad and my brother and my cousin. And so we got a chance to see where, where I was born and my dad could share some stories of growing up and flirting with girls on the Russian Metro and all sorts <laughs> of stuff. And so that was a lot of fun. So do you, just, do you come from an entrepreneurial background? I do. Yeah. So a lot of immigrants have that immigrant success story. And yeah. that's definitely the archetype that I was born into was my dad and mom and grandmother came over with me when I was about two and a half. And my dad started a medical equipment sales and service company probably about a year, year and a half after he came to the U.S. because he was about to get fired from Washington Hospital Center, which he worked at repairing mm -hmm. their equipment because he was moonlighting on the side repairing equipment for other docks. And so I grew up in a family business and saw that. And I had much better use of the English language. So my dad basically let me do all the marketing. And so at 14... I was writing ads, but the ads really sucked. I mean, they were horrible. Like, you know, they'd have like a big, huge whale on top. And it said, you know, you get a whale of a deal here. And then, but that's all I knew. But 14, I was telemarketing as well. So selling my own doctor clients, I was selling latex gloves. So I was telemarketing for that. Mm -hmm. And at 16, the deal was I got a car if I cold called on doctors, which was interesting because A, cold calling totally sucked. So I realized that there could be a better way. And then I got that better way actually by, I sold an entire surgery center to a doctor up in Frederick and we became friends and he was really into marketing and he gave me a Jay Abraham tape. And this was kind of the first time I ever learned about direct response marketing or another way of, of doing what I was doing. And, and it just blew the lights wide open for me. 
And then I just started learning everything I possibly could about copywriting, about direct response, about marketing in that way, and started applying it to my dad's business and, and helped them grow from a, kind of a regional player to a, a national player. Yeah, that's interesting how it, you know a lot of our influences from our childhood sort of bleed into the things that we currently do. And especially as we sort of hit our age and sort of look back at life and have children and so forth, it's kind of like, what are we... What are we doing with our lives? You know, what are we going to do that leaves a legacy and an impact? You know, leave it a little slightly better than when we first got it. I'm curious about the sort of network that you've produced here. Was there a particular need that you saw within sort of this family that you've created within the Maverick 1000 that wasn't being addressed? I mean, were people really just building out their companies and businesses and really just getting lost in sort of a world that didn't quite, you know, give them the experience and the collaboration and the family that you've created? Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, also talking about like what we did as kids or what those patterns were. So for me, I was totally, even junior high, high school, I was part of a bunch of different cliques, but never deep into any clique. So, you know, whether it's the jocks, you know, I played sports, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like a football or baseball player. I was a ice hockey player and a, and a beach volleyball player. But, you know, the sports or the, you know, I was in the gifted and talented program. But <laughs> someone reminded me the other day that I played Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, yeah. Did play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm like with everybody, right? But not deep, deep. And it's interesting because that carried over to what I did in business as well was I was a really good bridge maker between different groups and different industries and marketplaces. And so I really saw almost like scratching my own itch originally, which was hanging out with other fun entrepreneurs that didn't have the time or didn't make the time to go out and go rejuvenate themselves and have these opportunities to, to really put down their pencil and, and sharpen the pencil. And at the same time, to I was part of a lot of other CEO groups, uh, but at the same time, to really bring in this idea of, you know, could we make an impact and difference? And I didn't know it at the time because it's obviously been refined now, but there was always that element that you know, some people would call it the give back element, but I have a problem with that word. And maybe we'll, we'll talk about that. But there was always that give aspect. And then that was really the, the itch that I was scratching was there was no group that I, I was a part of that had not only the business side, but the impact side and the, and the fun side. Like there's so many times that we seem to lose that fun side or our inner child side as, as we get older. And I really want to keep that alive for everyone. Yeah. I mean, there have been so many of these sort of dry networking types of events that have propped up over the you know, the past two decades or so, but nothing that was really experiential. I love the experiential element that it's not just business, but business plus impact plus fun creates these sort of magical relationships that, you know, one plus one equals 10 in this in this circumstance. Can you share with us a couple of stories that really stick out to you in terms of, you know, how your organization has impacted the people within your network? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of interesting ones. I mean, on the fun side, I and mean, we'll do everything from, Help people that, you know, bring these types of costumes and they don't know what they're in for. And then we have like a Hollywood quality makeup artist make everyone into a zombie. And then we'll go do a zombie bar crawl on a random Monday or Tuesday night. <laughs> That's one. And you, I, you've been known to be pretty bold yourself in some of these costumes. Uh, we, we have, yeah, we have a good time <laughs> with the costumes for sure. And if people, they, they have to not take themselves too seriously. And those are the kind of people that I absolutely love. The people that have a little bit of junior high humor to them. And at the same time, have the capacity to really make a difference in the world, like to, to really move the needle in a big way. And, you know, another perfect example of that is on Necker Island, which is Richard Branson's island. So we're every year when we go there, it supports a charity called Virgin Unite, which I just recently got asked to be part of the board for one of their, their boards and very exciting. And but we've been helping them and working with them for quite a while. And this one meeting, we all had lemur outfits, like literally lemur onesies. And so there's lemurs that live on the island that Richard has brought on. And so we had, we were all in lemur outfits and pretending to be lemurs as Richard walks in, including the Virgin Unite team, right? So they're, they're mm -hmm. kind of up for anything. And they're, this is their big meeting, right? So they're going to talk to this group of entrepreneurs who have donated 250 some thousand dollars for <laughs> Virgin Unite and, and then pose their next big ask. And here they are in their lemur outfits because we said, that's what you have to do. So they're willing to play along and say yes. And then Richard walks up and he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and he gets right in his little lemur onesie and we take a photo and have, <laughs> you know, have the rest of the meeting, half the people in their lemur outfits still. So that fun aspect never really goes away from what we do. We definitely have a good time doing it. 
and yeah, maybe, maybe this something. certainly seemed like something Richard would have done way back in the day when he was building his Virgin Empire. Yeah, um, right up his alley. I mean, how did how did Richard Branson get involved with this whole thing? So I got asked by a buddy of mine. So Richard's been you know one of my biggest business heroes, and I got asked by a buddy of mine to come to Necker and to support his charity, Richard's charity. And I'm like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do it. So I came as a paid guest one year. And then the next year, my friend Joe was like, well, I don't think I can do it again because I don't have enough people. And I said, well, why don't we just do it together and split it? So that's how it ended up happening where now we've gone about, I think, nine or 10 years in a row. And the last couple of years, we've done it ourselves just as a Maverick only event. It's been really exciting and the kind of relationship that's been built. And then my kids are go to the island every year and, and just they'll throw water balloons at Richard. They'll like <laughs> last year, my daughter, who's nine years old, tried to buy the island from him. It's just you know, really, really amazing the kind of experience that they are able to to get as, as a part of it. And now does someone like a Richard Branson serve as actually mentors for your family, your Maverick family? He only when we're there, right? Yeah. So it's not a ongoing commitment or anything like that. So it's at that level, it's kind of a catch as you can kind of thing. So there's not an ongoing direct mentor relationship. How do you sustain engagement with a network in between these different experiences that you put together? That is a great question. I mean, the, the live experiences are definitely the piece that, that brings everyone together. And part of it is they will do it themselves. We have a couple of people who are just naturally sort of connectors and hubs themselves. They'll go out of their way in Austin and San Francisco right now to bring together Maverick members who are local there. And then also some that want to just fly in or other exceptional entrepreneurs that are local to them there. And they'll put on their own little I don't know, event or adventure or something like that. So one of the things that we even want to get better at and we've been pretty good at is not saying, hey, you can't do that because that's not an official Maverick event, but really mm -hmm. decentralizing it and giving, empowering them to go put on their own dinners and their own experiences as well. So that's one thing. And our Facebook community is fairly robust as far as activity wise. And it's a small group, about 100, maybe 115 that are in that group. In between is definitely something that is more difficult to pull off. We'll have a newsletter that brings people together and to know what's going on. We've tried different things. Some things worked well, some things haven't. With a smaller community, like having educational webinars or something like that, like that doesn't really work well because it also, I don't think, is where our sweet spot is. We're just really good at bringing people together. I call them sandboxes, like bringing exceptional people together in these sandboxes that create these really unique collisions and, and synchronistic experiences that they wouldn't have had any other way that really does force these deeper relationships. So that's harder to do virtually. Mm -hmm. Now you've been, I mean, since 2008, you've been doing this. I mean, that's pretty much being a pioneer in sort of creating some of these new experiential based events and live experiences for your network. There have since been things like Mai Tai and Summit Series and things like that, trying to you know, from a different perspective, sort of get into that space. I mean, do you see this as kind of the reimagined way or the future way of networking for, you know, a set of like-minded folks? Yeah, I don't know if it's the future way or not, but it's definitely a big, something that I'm a big proponent of. And I think you can see the results from those groups, like you mentioned, and, and others, where it just brings people together in a really unique way. I mean, it's like we're starving for human interaction in a meaningful way. And I don't know how many friends I have on Facebook, but are they really my friends? I don't, right. you know, not really. I mean, have, we, have we lost a sense of humanity because of a lot of the technology that's available to us? Yeah. I mean, it's like, I'm a big believer in going the opposite direction, right? So if everything's moving more digital, more digital than that true yeah. humanness, like, you know, you're talking about like that brings people together, but not just, I mean, even if you bring them together for a dinner, that's fine. I like to up the game even more. And I know you're a fan of this too. I mean, you had drum circles at unusual intersections. You had a lot, of, a lot of experiential pieces. You had the brunch that we had that was really nice farm to table brunch. You know, even the speaker gifts were really wonderful with the sketches that you had created. There's the typical, right? And everyone can do typical and everyone's seen typical. And then there's the, you know, somewhat unusual. And we even run a summer camp now for entrepreneurs the last two years because we like that unusual and to bring people into a space that really does amplify the connections and the, the cool stuff that's going to happen from it. So we'll have business sessions, but we don't have typical keynotes. We'll have a, we call them camp counselors and they're, they're almost more like campfire improv conversations. Mm -hmm. 
when people get together, are they conceiving up new ideas and new businesses together? Or is it more about helping them sort of get a little bit of a reprise that they can actually center themselves and, and do what they're doing even better or a little bit of both? Yeah. So there's sometimes agenda around it, right? Like creating ideas for the nonprofits, for the cause partners. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's just white space for them getting together. There's multiple Maverick members that have come together for specific businesses that they've started. And I couldn't be happier about it. You know, one that I'm thinking of in particular, just recently, one of our members is a physical therapist. He's an expert and helps other PTs as well with their practice. But he's really a specialist in human movement and that kind of, I don't know, your, your body mechanics and so forth. And so he teamed up with another Maverick member who has a really deep passion for culture. And she has about 400, 350 some employees. I might be off a little bit, but, and she's also been part of this Virgin Unite initiative called 100% Human at Work, which is about bringing your 100% humanity to work and companies helping push that forward. So they created a company, which is still you know kind of under wraps right now and very early stage, but it's going to be a new, really a new kind of desk. So they have a couple of treadmill desks at their office and so forth. And to have people have that body mechanic work while they're at work and someone behind it that knows what's going on and someone who really cares tremendously about team culture. And, and this is going to raise the team culture and these companies that care about it and have health initiatives. So it's really exciting to see what can happen with that. And they're forming it under the flagship and, and framework of an evolved enterprise. So it sounds like you're bringing people in from all walks of life. And what's the criteria that you've set up that allows someone to become a member? Yeah. So the criteria right now, there's an objective criteria and then a very subjective one. Mm -hmm. The objective one, which is pretty easy to meet, is a million dollars in gross revenue. So very simple. But the subjective one is that you have to be either someone that has a big voice distribution in your particular marketplace already or a, an industry leader so you can be a lighthouse and a touchstone for others in your industry or someone that, that has that potential path to be one or have world-class capabilities. And kind of the, the shortcut for it is we talk about the thousand suns. So lighting a thousand suns and a sun is an entire universe creator. So you have to have the capacity to be a universe creator and to light a thousand more suns. Hmm. Yeah, I love those. I love that criteria. I want to transition a little bit now in the time that we've got remaining to talk about your book, Evolved Enterprise, getting rave reviews, really focused on talking about sort of the, you know, the, the organization's larger responsibility to do something even bigger and greater beyond itself. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write the book and what you're hoping would be the reader's key takeaways from there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I do want to just point out, you mentioned, you know, organizations, larger responsibility. I don't, I don't look at this as a responsibility to make mm. an impact. I look at it because that implies that we have to do it. Mm. To me, this is like, you want to do it because A, it is just a better way of doing business and B, it actually improves your bottom line. And so what the Evolved Enterprise Framework has is a way of truly connecting, whether it's you, the founder, with your head and your heart and your higher purpose, or the entire company itself with the soul of what the organization is. And it connects everyone working there with a higher purpose, a higher mission for what they want to do and aligning them there. And then it gets customers to want to buy more and, and share what, what they've already bought and changes their identity. And it just, it just makes sense. Like it serves the collective, which ultimately serves us in the greatest way. And that's, what's really exciting by it. So it's for entrepreneurial companies. It's for bigger companies that are realizing, Hey, this is not just a trend, but this is like a seismic shift that's happening. And it's happening from the outside in, which is consumer buying behavior is changing, that consumers are willing to either spend more or spend the same and change their buying loyalty to companies that have an impact or a mission around what they're doing. And then coming from the inside out, which is our talent. So keeping attracting and keeping the best A players that they're driven by companies that want to make a difference and, and authentically do that. And is there is there a blueprint or a, or a framework or a playbook for organizations to, to essentially follow to become an evolved enterprise? Yeah, absolutely. So inside the book and probably even on the site, I think I just have the, the simple framework. So it starts with, there's three big pillars that we talked about originally, which we call Maverick DNA, which are, if you think of a shortcut, would be a happy face, a heart, and a dollar sign. And those three interconnected are, you know, I just learned it's called the Venn diagram recently. But, <laughs> but that Venn diagram is your DNA, right? So everything is totally interconnected from that. And then the next circle that surrounds that is, is the you circle. And it really starts with us as the leader, really getting 
kind of filling our own cups first and then then it can overflow to everything else, whether it's our team, our family, our organization, our community, even the world. But it starts with us first and everything from being more mindful. There's been this really nice movement towards more mindfulness in the workplace. And, and that's been really exciting to see to creating more meaning in your life and, you know, tracking what you're grateful for and, and the scientific proof and studies around that and, and even movement, which is such a simple thing, but mm-hmm. are, are, you know, it, it makes such a huge difference. And so I have you know, a lot of these and exploring what, what is our unique aspect of, of what do we do? better than anybody else and what do we love to do and what gives us more energy and so that's the you portion and then the next circle outward is called cause which is our big why our, our impact our way to move from simply a transactional company to a transformational to even transcending company like transcending what business could be and and then the outer ring is divided up into three and that's the culture which is that internal side of how do our, how do we help our team show up as their greatest selves and what does that culture and our core values look like and our vision for where we're going our North Star, and then our community, which is our, our customers and getting getting them excited and forming them into tribes of, of zealots and advocates, and then the creation, which is the product or service, and how do we bake in that impact, that cause that we've identified. Yeah, I love that framework. Are there are there some examples that you would highlight as sort of being the prototypical evolved enterprise? Yeah, I have a lot. You know, there's 11 different impact models I talk about in the book, and probably one that, that a lot of people are familiar with is that buy one, give one. You know, Tom's really mm-hmm. helped not necessarily pioneer it, but they've really made it popular. You know, Blake just reviewed the book and who founder of Tom's and he he loved it and had a, a great quote for it. But they've they've done something really exciting, which which I call an impact scoreboard inside the book. Where, you know, last time I talked to Blake, he's telling me that they've given away 35 million pairs of shoes. I'm sure it's been more by now. And so now that impact scoreboard is a way that we can reverse engineer what it means to be a success. So the team is looking at that, you know, the customers are looking at that. So as a reverse byproduct of that, we know that we've sold 35 million pairs of shoes profitably. So that's that's really exciting. And that's that's just one model. The ones that I get really even more excited by is where it starts combining different facets of what a business can do well. Because I, I truly believe that business can be the greatest lever for making a difference in the world and not in a guilt-driven way, but in a true market-based value exchange. And so a couple other less known examples, there's a handbag company called Sarah Oliver, which is mm-hmm. named after a woman named Sarah, Sarah Oliver, <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> enough. But she started making these handbags, these hand knit handbags and got a lot of attention for them. People loved them, started selling them out of trunk shows and so forth. And, and then retailers started calling. And what happened was she went to just a local community center, an adult kind of community center and said, is there anyone that knows how to, how to do this knitting? she remembers doing it as a kid with her grandmother and that's what, how her handbags were created so now she has a small little army of, of senior citizens who are average age like 85 maybe 88 and and they're the ones that create the handbag so there's a great story of who makes your handbag and it's it's just such a great way of business empowering a group of a community that isn't as maybe as, as thought upon as a great work resource but but there's so many you know, aspects that, that a business can do like that. I call that empowered employment. And there's another example just like that of empowered employment where where this company that does quality control testing and, and cross-browser platform testing and so forth, they, they employ people on the autism spectrum scale to be the testers because typically people on the autism spectrum scale are, are much better at, at details or much better at, at uh, repetitive tasks and so forth. And, and it's just a perfect way of turning what could be a disadvantage into an advantage. Those are great examples. Do you find that businesses that follow the impact model ultimately end up performing better in terms of the bottom line by, by doing so? Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I do want to highlight that it, it's absolutely the case. And so, you know, if you're looking at it from a pragmatic business side, it's, <laughs> this is the solution. And I, I honestly believe like Forbes quoted me as saying that in the next four to seven years, businesses that don't have a, a core impact in what they do are going to be at a competitive disadvantage. And they even said on life support. So they took it one step further, which, you know, I, I can get behind that. And there's an interesting book that's that's kind of dated now, but it's great because it has a lot of years behind their data is called uh, Firms of Endearment. And they looked at companies like Whole Foods and Southwest Airlines and Container Store who have a really, really deep culture of what they do with their, their team, which you know some people might look at as just an expense, but they compared their results to the S&P 500. And they found that over one, two years is kind of negligible, but over 10 years, it was a thousand plus percent return 
different on return on investment. So those companies did way better in the long run. And to me, that that's really exciting to see companies like that. And you can look at, you know, these new evolved enterprises like Warby Parker, which is the eyeglass company. Mm-hmm. They came out of nowhere. 2010 is when they started. They just got valued at a billion dollars. Yeah. And you're seeing so many other organizations. Do you think it'll eventually get drowned out of so many organizations and companies? I, so yeah. I mean, I think model. it's not going to become a competitive... <laughs> like right now, you have this opportunity to almost like do something that, that puts you at the forefront of what is not just a trend, but like I said, a seismic shift of where, where the world is, is heading already and where it's continuing to grow and go. So later on, it's just going to be, this is like expected. This is the way we do business. Yeah, it's unusual at the time right now. It's very different for now, but ultimately everything unusual becomes usual or everything different becomes normal. Yeah. Um, so certainly we'll lose that competitive edge. Now, what I love, you know, so many people who write books and, and run organizations don't live by what they preach or what they teach. You certainly do. You don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk. And I know that you run and do certain centering experiments with your family to sort of keep you guys, you know, together and centered and mindful of the things that, you know, of everyday life around you. Can you share a couple of those little mini family experience that you've done? Yeah, absolutely. So I I totally believe in this holistic aspect of entrepreneurship because our lives are as entrepreneurs are pretty much intermeshed with with everything else. And if our businesses thrive to the detriment of our of our family or our health or any other aspect of our relationships, then I think we've lost. So, you know, do I do I have it nailed down perfectly? No, absolutely not. But there is intention behind what we think about and what we do. And one of the things that we did is actually try to bring core values to our family. So, you know, we live by and are getting better by living by core values inside our company. And so why not bring that to your your family as well? And I started learning this from a guy named Richard Eyre, E-Y-R-E, out of Park City, Utah. And he's probably one of the best value-based parenting experts in the world right now. And and so we decided to do an exercise where we had all the kids take post-it notes and start writing down what's it mean to be a silver. And they wrote it all down and, and then we put it up on the wall, you know, very, very much like a, running like an offsite for a company. <laughs> and then we started combining them together and, and then fighting over different ones. And, and what happened is that they turned into what we call now the 13 silver keys and 13 silver keys. It kind of it just, it just has a nice ring to it too. Yeah, silver keys. Fun, yeah exactly. So I, I like the idea of the, the, Galati, the Galati keys just, <laughs> it just doesn't sound as good. <laughs> well, you can call them. I'm a big fan of like making it fun. Like, you know, they could be like the G Force something, the G Force, or, or the, you know, the, the the G5, whatever it is. And then it could be five G things, right? So you know, you make it, you make it fun, and you make it memorable, and and but it has to be part of a routine or a ritual that happens all the time. And so ours originally was kind of based on Ben Franklin's 13 virtues, where every week he would work on something on his life and then he'd record what happened and and that was the original intention because then you hit it four times a year and the kids slightly revolted about that but but we, we turned it now into every sunday night they look at the 13 silver keys it's a sign in one of the hallways in the, in the house oh nice and i don't know if you saw it when you came over i don't think i, no, I don't think i don't think I yeah. saw it. so we have it there and they, so they'll, they'll look at that and then at dinner they're just to share two three things that happened during the week that have how they live this silver keys and so everyone does it. I do it. My wife does it. And I'll, I'll share different things going on in my, in my world too. Like, you know, not just at their sort of, you know, nine-year-old, 11-year-old level, but in my world, there's stuff that I'm grateful for and, and happy about or, or whatever the silver key is that I'm sharing. So a couple of them are like, go the extra mile. Everything's wonderful, which is kind of like a perspective shift of how do we think about what, what is wonderful, you know? There's just the word give. So that mm-hmm. aspect, there's trying to think what some of the other ones are. There's there's sing, dance, and laugh. So so really they have a combination of, of what they can look at. And I realize that it's it's working when they one of them's make magic. So it's like how <laughs> yeah, stuff that shows up that, that's kind of magical and, and serendipitous and it's it's really fun. So, you know, I realize that stuff like that's working when something occurs. Zach, my my son might say something and then a song comes on that. It was the exact same thing he says, right? And he's like, oh, make magic moment. You know, so it's like they, they start embedding that and really integrating it into their, in their life. And that's, that's important to me. Those are so great. I'm actually just jotting down some notes here, some great ideas I'm going to start uh, trying to toy around with. I love, I love the fact that it's not, 
you know, you don't just teach organizations how to run more effectively, but, you know, how to let individuals live a more fulfilled life and that the combination of the two, you know, rarely bleed into each other, right? I mean, if, if you're fulfilled at what you do as an individual, then you're going to run a better organization. And if you've got a better organization, you're going to be more satisfied as an individual as well. And they're, they're very intricately tied to each other. So what's the next chapter for Maverick? What's, what do you have on your plate? That's a great question. I think it is this entire ecoverse that we're building. So Maverick is really one part of it. We also have a group called Maverick Next, which are young entrepreneurs, 18 to 25, which has this nice mentorship relationship that mm-hmm. happens. We have the summer camp that I mentioned. We, we do a family event teaching kids about business. So that's all, the, all about creating these sandboxes for these exceptional individuals to come together. And then the publishing education side, the media side, is the evolved enterprise piece. And then a third hub, the the least sort of explored one, but the one that I'm most excited by is this idea factor, bringing together ideas that can make an impact in the world and then have the distribution through the Maverick network and the the mentorship and and the networking connections that they need to get that out into the world. And then it's a real nice interconnectedness between all of them because it's they get taught the education for an involved enterprise. There's an accreditation program for it. They can be part of Maverick Next as young entrepreneurs and are part of that idea factory of, of just this incubator. I love it. I look forward to sort of keeping on top of what you've got, what you're developing along. So with that, I want to jump into sort of what I do for all my guests, which I should ask these sort of rapid fire, fill in the blank, Mad Lib types of questions. So if you're game, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, let's do it. All right. The first one is the best piece of advice I ever received was. It's interesting because I was just thinking about this as I was going to share it with, I, I coach a hockey team. My, my son plays ice hockey and I was going to tell one of the kids who's every once in a while gets really off his game because he gets, he get knocked over and he comes off and he's you know upset mm-hmm. and really pissed off or he'll go out and go get penalty afterwards. And I tell my wife this all the time, but she doesn't like to hear it either. But it's, I think I learned it from Stephen Covey. And it was creating that space between stimulus and response. Mm-hmm. And, and the greater that space is that you can create. And, and this is what so many of the mindfulness practices are, are about as well. It's like just, just being, being present and not overreacting to that moment of, of what happens, right? So creating, if you can widen that space of, okay, something happens, someone cuts you off, the deal falls through, what, you know, whatever it is, if you can widen that response then, then you just have a better way of reacting to the world. Yeah, totally agree. Great advice. All right, next one. I'm most curious about. Oh man, I mean, right now I'm. You know, you would have asked me this ten years ago; it would have been totally different. But but right now, I'm absolutely incredibly curious about what I would say is the big story. And the big story is how does everything fit in? Whether it's cosmology, whether it's biology, chemistry, like I, I probably learn way more out of school recently than than ever in school because none of it made sense to me about mm-hmm. what how it fit into the big picture of you know these single cell structures and then creating multi-cell structures and then how the weak and strong nuclear forces have to be at the exact right way in order to create the universe and 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 then could the universe actually be a single photon that's holographic and fractal like you know the quantum fit like that's just fascinating to me but like how does it all fit together yeah, I love that. Yeah, the big story. How do the, how do the dots connect? Really cool. All right, next one. If you had to write a book about yourself, sort of an autobiography about yourself, the, the title of the book would be? Oh, how about The Journey to Merge Your Head, Your Heart, and Higher Purpose Without Forgetting About Your Happy Inner Child? Hmm. Yeah, love it. Long title, but love it. I know. And maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the subtitle. <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. That speaks uh, that speaks volumes about you. All right, two more. Next one. If you could invite three people over for dinner, dead or alive, who would you invite, and what would you talk about? Oh man, and these could be cartoon characters too. Or fictional oh, characters. cartoon characters. Now we're now we're getting somewhere. So I did grow up in a lot, with a lot of cartoons. Dead, uh, alive, or fake, or great. Right. <laughs> I mean, someone that I would love to get to know a little bit is Bono. I just think that he is. Mm-hmm such a humanitarian and what he does and the impact that he's able to bring through his celebrity ship, if that's a word. So I'd be fascinated by, by having a, a little conversation with him. And, and then of course we'd make him play guitar or something, but <laughs> of course sing or whatever <laughs> a guy named Earl Nightingale, who I don't know if, you know, as many people might be familiar with, he was one of my favorite mentors early on via audio. 
you know, you can find like the strangest secret or lead the field is probably his most popular recordings. Mm-hmm. I used to just listen to that over and over again. I think for someone who just, just really got understood that, that success factor and human potential, he was, he was really interesting. And then to mix it up with, with someone else, Oh, it would just bring over the Dalai Lama. He seems like he'd be. <laughs> there's a great book that him and Desmond Tutu just put out called The Book of Joy. And, and there's two people, they have almost every reason in the world not to be happy. And they just bring so much joy and, and laughter. And, you know, he, he's such a happy soul that I love. I love that aspect. Yeah. It's a nice, uh, I like your three, man. Nice set of diverse perspectives at the table there. All right. Last one for you. So, you know, on this podcast, we like to celebrate all those things that make us different, unique. So how would you fill in this following blank? I'm unusual because. I would say I am unusual because I catalyze the catalysts. That's the thing I get really excited by. And, and what I think is, is the unique aspect of what I do is I look for people that have unique leverage in who they are and what they do and then bring them together in kind of like a crock pot of unusualness to steal still unusualness there but, but you know i think that's why you and i get along so well is because it's similar right yeah. it's, it's bringing together those kind of people but but i like bringing them together where where we also have sometimes an objective sometimes yeah. not an objective to but yeah catalyze the catalyst well, i think that's a perfect way to cap off this episode yannick it was such a delight having a conversation with you and getting to know sort of a different end of you and a different perspective but you know what before we wrap up here if our listeners wanted to learn a little bit more about you, about Maverick 1000, get a copy of your book, what is the place or some places that you would direct them to? Yeah, so to check out what we're doing with Maverick 1000, just maverick1000.com, the number, and evolvedenterprise.com is the book. And every once in a while, I blog on my personal site, which is yannicksilver.com, Y-A-N-I-K, silver.com. All right. Perfect. All right. Everyone go visit those websites and go pick up a copy of his book, which is amazing. I've got a couple of them. And Yannick, thank you so much. It was a delight speaking to you today. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, it was fun. Hi again. It's me, Dr. G. If you are still listening, I'm hoping it's because you enjoyed this podcast. If you would like to hear future episodes, you could really help me out by subscribing to the That's Unusual podcast on iTunes and leaving a review. It goes a long way in helping me get the word out from avid listeners like you. As a thank you, I will be selecting one new reviewer each week at random for a free private 15-minute phone conversation where you can ask me anything and get professional advice on your career or business to help you stand out and make a difference. Also, if you want to be notified of any future episodes, please visit thatsunusualpodcast.com and sign up to receive updates on new episode releases. Until next time, remember to always think unusual.